This morning, we are going to finish our summer series. We've called it Inspired Prayers. We've been looking at some of the prayers of the New Testament. And uh, so we're going to be wrapping that up today. Next Sunday, we're going to start a new series called Real Church Growth. And we're going to talk about what is it that is the real evidence of a church that's growing. And it's not just counting noses. Well, thinking about the passage this morning got me thinking about fireworks. I don't know how many of you guys uh, like fireworks, but I love fireworks. In fact, I have a, a whole bunch of special memories around fireworks. One of the things, as I was thinking about it, uh, kind of a special memory was uh, Burnett and I were fairly newlyweds, the first uh, two, three years of marriage, and we had moved down to Southern California. I was starting graduate school, and as most people can tell you, when they are young, married, and going to school full-time, they are also broke. So we had mastered the cheap date. And one of the cheap dates we had was back then, uh, Disneyland did not have all the big stacked parking garages. They were o- it was open parking lots, which you paid to get in up until about 9 p.m. And at 9 p.m., they didn't man the ticket booths anymore, and you could pull in and park for free. Of course, who would go to Disneyland starting at 9 o'clock in the evening? However, if you go at 9 o'clock and park, you could walk up to the gates and you could stand outside the gate and you could see all the fireworks that went off at 9.30. And so for free, we could go to Disneyland and watch the fireworks. So that was one of our special dates. Uh, I remember when our, we started having kids and little kids. We were at the time living in Central California, a place called Sonora. We were right next to Calaveras County. Any of you that know Mark Twain's writings, you may know the jumping frog of Calaveras County. Well, that is where that story is set. And so we would go to the Calaveras County Fairgrounds to watch the fireworks over there. A lot of good memories. One year they tried doing fireworks in Sonora, which I thought was interesting because Sonora is one of those areas that has real high fire danger. And so normally fireworks were not done, but for some reason the county fathers decided they would do a fireworks show this year, and they were going to do it out at the baseball fields. Well, there was the grandstand area where everybody, most people were sitting, but there were a bunch of us that had gone around onto the back side of the field. We're outside the fence in what was supposed to be the safe area, uh, watching the fireworks show. They had two of the fireworks that malfunctioned. And they went about 30, 40 feet up, turned over, and exploded. And we were suddenly not at the fireworks show. We were in the fireworks show. I had never had the bloom like go past me on both sides. Everybody is yelling, ducking for cover. Of course, it lit off all these little grass fires all around us. I mean, there are firemen running everywhere trying to stomp out fires. And I believe that was the last year that we had a live fireworks show in Sonora. Uh, More recently, we've discovered, I don't know if you know about this, but up in Vancouver, B.C., they have every year what they call the Festival of Light, which is a week-long event, and it's an international fireworks competition. Uh, Three countries participate every year. One country goes, I think, on Monday night, one on Wednesday night, and one on Friday night, uh, showing their best uh, on fireworks. And it is a great display. I, I love those. The best part, of course, of any fireworks display is the grand finale, right? I mean, that's when they light off everything and it goes up together. And that is the highlight of the show. As I was looking at the passage for this week, I just got thinking about fireworks. I got thinking about grand finales. And I want to walk through this passage with you and see if maybe you see the same. The prayer we want to look at is uh, a bit of a different prayer. It's a benediction, really. And it comes out of Jude, And it's verses 24 and 25. There's no need to announce the chapter because there's only one chapter in the book of Jude. Here's how it reads. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, And now and forevermore, amen. This is really a different kind of prayer. If you look at it, you realize that that Jude isn't really asking God for anything. It's rather a prayer of superlative worship. It's directing back to God the attributes that are already his. 
Jude is an interesting book. It's one of those little books in the New Testament that usually gets passed over. It is very short. You can read the whole book in under four minutes. And it's, uh, it doesn't get attention very often. I think there's some reasons for that. It doesn't recount any particular historical information like, say, the book of Acts does. It doesn't teach a lot of doctrine. It doesn't give a lot of specific counsel for living on how to live life. What it does do is it uses a whole variety of illustrations and images to make the point that Jude wants to make. And some of those images, some of those illustrations are a little weird to modern ears. We're not quite sure what to do with them, and so I think we tend to pass over it. There is one thing that it does. It is a passionate call for a group of Christians to turn away from a group of false teachers. What do we know about Jude? Well, there's a lot we don't know. We don't know precisely who it was that Jude was writing to. It's not the letter of the Colossians, where we know he was writing to believers at Colossae. We don't know exactly who Jude was writing to, although it appears from all the illustrations he uses that it was a primarily Jewish audience, because a lot of the stories that he tells, the metaphors he uses, are metaphors that would only make sense to Jews. We don't know precisely what the false teachers were teaching, but we do get some clues. And if you want the short form, what he's warning them about are false teachers that were trying to sway people toward sex and money. Not much has changed. What Jude saw was he saw some greedy, lust-driven people who were posing as followers of Jesus that were trying to manipulate others away from a sincere faith in Jesus. An interesting little side note is, if you compare the book of Jude to 2 Peter, especially 2 Peter chapter 2, you will find a lot of overlap. Some of the very same illustrations and language. And we're not sure if Peter was quoting Jude or Jude was quoting Peter, but they obviously knew each other and knew what each one had written. So who was Jude? Well, he begins his little book this way. It says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So the simplest understanding is that Jude was one of Jesus' earthly half-brothers. I think we've talked about this in the past. In case you've missed that, let me just highlight that quickly. Jesus did have earthly brothers, right? Half-brothers. Mary and Joseph had children. Uh, Jesus was not Joseph's blood son, but Joseph was his father, and Mary and Joseph had other sons and daughters. Matthew chapter 13, verses 53 through 55, in recounting this one incident out of Jesus' life, uh, the people in the town make this statement. They say, are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, or Jude? So Jude uh, is one of these half-brothers of Jesus. Uh, we also know that during Jesus' earthly ministry, although we had these relatives, they did not necessarily believe that he was who he claimed he was. John chapter 7 talks about how Jesus went about in Galilee. He wasn't going to Judea because the Jews wanted to kill him. But his brothers said to him, Leave here, go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you're doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. So why did they say this? Because not even his brothers believed in him. James was one of those unbelieving brothers. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 has an interesting little aside regarding the resurrection. Speaking of Jesus' appearance after the resurrection to different followers, it says, Then he, Jesus, appeared to James and then to all of the apostles. And we find that James, in turn, one of Jesus' earthly half-brothers, goes from being an unbeliever to being not just a believer, but a leader. He becomes a leader at the church in Jerusalem. The book of Galatians tells us this. When James and Cephas, another name for Peter, and John, who seem to be pillars, in other words, pillars of the Jerusalem church, perceived the grace given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me. This is Paul talking about the validation he received from the leaders at Jerusalem. And he acknowledges that among the believers in that church, 
James, the earthly half-brother of Jesus, was one of the pillars, one of the leaders of that church. But it wasn't just James who came to believe. Acts 1.14 tells us that all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So you have this dramatic shift. These guys who had grown up with Jesus, who initially couldn't believe that he was who he said he was, come after the resurrection, after the experience of all that happens, they go from being unbelievers to being believers. And so we come to Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. It's interesting that Jude does not say, and brother of Jesus. He only identifies himself by his relationship to James. Uh, James himself takes much the same approach. The, the, the book of James starts off this way. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why doesn't James say a brother, a half-brother of Jesus Christ? It seems like both of these men, once they understood who Jesus was, would not attempt to to name drop that relationship. The only name that Jude is willing to drop to establish his credentials is that of his older and better known brother, James. Now, there are some scholars that debate Jude's authorship. Some think it might have been another Jude at a later time or someone writing under Jude's name to establish their own credibility. That was quite common in the ancient world. But the identity of Jude as the half-brother of Jesus has been the most commonly accepted understanding of the author of this book. So why did Jude write? So, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about your common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. I started off talking about fireworks. Jude is actually quite a fiery book. It's like a whole bunch of little bursting rockets going off one after another as Jude keeps hammering at this central point, which is to discourage them from listening to these false teachers. And he gives some very vivid descriptions of what these false teachers were doing. He says, these are people that pervert the grace of God into sensuality. He says, they deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. He goes on later to say that they rely on dreams. In other words, there were apparently people who had uh, claimed to have some sort of mystical dreams that was giving them a, an authority. They, they had inside knowledge about God that had come to them through their dreams, or so they said, and that's why they wanted people to listen to them. He says, these are people who defile the flesh. You see images like this come up several times. There was uh, obviously sexual promiscuity, sexual perversion that was part of what these people were trying to sell to these folks. He describes them as rebels who reject authority. He talks about them as being blasphemers. They blaspheme the glorious ones. They proudly claim that they have a spiritual authority for themselves, that they have the right to speak against spiritual authorities. He talks about them being like unreasoning animals. Uh, the idea is that what they profess is not the true doctrine of Jesus Christ. Rather, what they are professing to be truth is whatever comes to them instinctively. It, it's just whatever feels good. This feels good, and I'm sure that God wants me happy, and this feels like it makes me happy, so this must be right. He says they are like unreasoning animals. He describes them as hidden reefs. Any of you that are sailors understand the danger of a hidden reef. It looks like you've got open water and smooth sailing. And yet right below the surface is something that will tear the keel out of your boat and sink it. He says that's what these people are like. They look like it's all smooth sailing, but he says what they are selling to you is a hidden reef, and it will sink you. He describes them as 
shepherds who feed themselves. The job of shepherds is to make sure the sheep get fed. And he says, these shepherds aren't about the sheep. These shepherds are about themselves. They are, if you will, narcissists. What matters to them about the flock is how the flock can meet their needs. He describes them as waterless clouds swept along by winds. Especially to people living in a desert environment. To see clouds was a promise of moisture, of rain, of being refreshed. He says, and these people, they show up and they've got big promises and they get you excited and you think, man, maybe something good is coming. But he says, they're just waterless clouds that are flying by on the wind. They don't really have anything for you. He calls them fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Here, you're looking to people that should be producing fruit. They should be feeding you. And he says, there is no fruit on the tree. In fact, there's like no fruit on the tree and it's late fall. There is not going to be any fruit on the tree. It's not just no fruit on the tree in late fall. They are ripped up by the roots. There is never going to be fruit on this tree. If you're looking to them as your source, you are going to be disappointed. He talks about them being like wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. He says, these people are rogue waves. They will sneak up on you and they will crash over you. And all they have to show for it is the foam of their own shame. Again, I think referring to the kind of sexual perversion that seemed to be part of the message of these false teachers. He talks to them as being wandering stars. I think the idea here is if you're a sailor and you are trying to navigate, you know, in the days before GPS, you navigate by the stars. And that means you have to be able to trust that the stars are going to stay where the stars belong if they're going to set your direction. It says, these guides, these people that want you to follow them, to rely on them, to let you set your direction by them, he says, they are wandering stars. If you try to set your compass, your course by them, you are going to go off course and be misled. He talks about them being grumblers and malcontents and... Uh, Loudmouth boasters. Uh, these people do not respect authority. That they are constantly picking and nipping at whoever is supposedly over the church there. And what they're really concerned about is themselves. They are trying to tear others down to build themselves up. And then he says they show, favorit show favoritism to gain advantage. In other words, these are bootlickers. These people come in and they may tell you nice things and they'll try and build you up and, and they'll play favorites, but it's not because they really think well of you. The only reason they are showing those favorites is because they want to manipulate you. And then there's a lot of images that Jude paints about the fate that awaits these people. And this is where he gets into all of this imagery out of Israel's history. He talks about uh, Israel's deliverance from Egypt, which was wonderful. But then, as we know, the people of Israel refused to go into the promised land. They didn't believe that God would deliver the land into their hands. And the result was, Jude reminds them, they were destroyed. They spent 40 years in the wilderness till that generation died off. And then there's some very interesting imagery that uh, comes out of an extra-biblical book, the book of Enoch, which would have been commonly known to the Jews in that time. That, that book is long lost to us, but they would have known about this. And Jude is kind of pulling up any image he can, any picture he can to make his point. And so he refers to this story that comes out of that about angels who did not stay in their position of authority, but, but, ele but left their proper dwelling place. And he says, in that story, these angels were held under judgment. Also out of the book of Enoch, he says there's a prophecy that says the Lord will come with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment. Then he refers to Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, remember Sodom and Gomorrah that it indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires, that they underwent this punishment of eternal fire. And then another interesting reference, and when the archangel Michael Contending with the devil was disputing about the body of Moses. He did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, that's a weird one. 
You can't find that story anywhere in the Bible about the archangel Michael contending with Satan over the body of Moses. What it appears that this comes from is an ancient work called the Ascension of Moses. In fact, uh, Origen, one of the early church fathers, he talks about it. He says, in the work entitled The Ascension of Moses, a little treatise of which the Apostle Jude makes mention in his epistle, the archangel Michael, when disputing with the devil regarding the body of Moses, and then he goes on. So while we don't have this ancient document, again, it's one that Jews would have been familiar with. And Jude, in making his point about how God will judge people who distort the message, he pulls up this imagery out of that well-known story of the time. Then he goes on to talk about the sin of Cain. Cain, who was judged for his sin of murder that was motivated by his jealousy. Again, these false teachers were apparently jealous of the leaders. They didn't want to submit to them. They were grumbling. They were malcontents. And he says, well, don't forget about Cain and what happened to him. And he also talks about Balaam. If you go back and look at the story of Balaam, Balaam was a prophet who, for the sake of money, tried to go against what God had told him to say. The result was that God made his donkey deliver the message. Then we have a guy named Korah. Korah also, for the sake of greed, rebelled, broke what had been God's very clear commands, and Korah and his family all paid the price. And so Jude just pulls up image after image after image to say, look at the history, look at the stories that you know. You know how this ends, and it doesn't end well. Don't listen to these people. Do those kind of teachers still exist today? Oh, I think they do. Jude says this, Remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. So Jude has some counsel for these folks. He says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt, save others by snatching them out of the fire, to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garments stained by the flesh. Seven pieces of advice he has for these folks. The first is, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. He says, know your Bible. Know what is true. Encourage each other. Become deep in knowing God. The second thing he says is, pray in the Holy Spirit. What I think he means there is, is not that they needed to be in some ecstatic state of mind when they prayed, but, but rather it is that they would pray in accordance with the Spirit's leading. That they would seek to know God's heart and to pray in line with that. He tells them to keep in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. See, these false teachers, I think part of their message was kind of a free love message. That's where some of the sexual perversity came into it. If it feels good, do it. And he says, brothers and sisters, keep yourselves in a pure love, in the love of God. A love that doesn't take advantage of others for self-gratification, but a love that is serving to others and has their very best in mind and honors them and honors God. Fourth, he says, wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Waiting is hard, isn't it? That's what makes sin so attractive. Sin is always right here, right now, you can have it. And we get caught up in that sometimes, don't we? I, I know what would make me feel good right now. And, and so I want to go and do it right now. I'm getting older. I may not have much time to enjoy this. I better hurry up and get it done. And Jude says, wait. Wait for the Lord. What he has is better 
And then he talks about three ways that we can help brothers and sisters who are struggling or falling into error. First, he says, have mercy on those who doubt. I've shared my story numerous times, going through a long season of doubt. I think this became one of my life verses during that period of my life, have mercy on those who doubt. God doesn't condemn people for having doubts. God knows that we all go through times and seasons of life, things that make us question, make us wonder. And Jude doesn't say, well, throw those people out. He says, no, have mercy on them. Love them, help them, comfort them, counsel them. Have mercy on those who doubt. Others, he says, save them by snatching them from the fire. I think what he means is sometimes you see a brother or sister that is on the wrong road. And sometimes we try to be nice. We don't want to meddle. We don't want to interfere. And so we just kind of take a hands-off approach like, well, I'm not going to say anything. And, and we watch them go down in flames. He says, listen, part of loving each other means that sometimes you see a brother or sister getting themselves into a bad spot and you have a responsibility to step in and say, I love you. Don't go there. If you can snatch them out of that, you are saving them from untold grief. And then he says, to some, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Sometimes loving people and intervening means even saying the hard thing or taking the hard action. The Apostle Paul talked to churches where there was immorality happening in the church, and the church, in the name of grace, the uh, book of 1 Corinthians, you find this, we're just kind of letting it go. Like, well, this shows how loving and accepting we are that we're not saying anything. Paul says, my goodness, what are you doing? You know, you, you are allowing people to be hurt. You are allowing others to be drawn into sin. He says, you need to step in and do the hard thing. And in that case, it was an act of church discipline. He said, I actually want you to put this person out. Now, 2 Corinthians, you find they did such a good job of putting him out, they wouldn't let him back in. The guy had repented and Paul has to say, let him back in. But, but sometimes it means even doing the hard thing. And Jude says, if you love people, you'll have mercy on those who doubt. You will save others by snatching them from the fire. And to some, you'll show mercy with fear. Now, all of that said, I have to say that sometimes the messiness among supposed followers of Jesus is wearing to me at times. If you've been following headlines in recent weeks, you've heard of a couple prominent young Christian superstars who suddenly tweeted to the world that they were walking away from the faith. They left behind churches, and at least one case, they left behind their wife. My blood boils when I run into certain Christian television personalities who boast about and live opulent lifestyles and seem to spend most of their time begging others to give them more money and, and preach it as being a gospel that will enrich those who give as long as they give to them and make them richer. Sometimes I see Christian leaders who seem to be more concerned about being hip and cool and relevant than about being faithful, humble, and true to Jesus. I see believers Sometimes believers who have seemingly walked with God for a long time and profess to know him, and yet who fall into patterns of life that are anything but the way of Jesus. And, and yet somehow they justify it that it's God's provision or God's blessing or God won't mind or God will forgive me and it'll all be okay. And, and you see the destruction that it brings. I think Jude found himself in a similar place. Jude saw people that he loved being misled. He saw them falling into things that he knew were going to tear them apart. And, and he was grieved. He was angry. When you read the book of Jude, you see, it's, it's, again, it's like fireworks, it's like one rocket after another. Jude just going boom, 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 boom. Guys, stop this. And Jude could have ended up on a dark note. It could have ended up just being disappointed and angry, but it's not. Jude finishes by turning his eyes back to Jesus. 
he reminds himself that the people he's writing to are dear brothers and sisters. And yes, there are troublemakers that sneak in. There are dangers that can suck people down, and, and yet they are not the majority. And that the, the followers of Jesus are in the hands of someone who is far, far greater than any self-absorbed, self-appointed Pied Piper that might have come in and tried to lure them away. And so Jude finishes his letter by turning his eyes to the one that he knows can keep them from falling prey. He turns his eyes back to Jesus, the one who, by his blood, by the power of his resurrection, will one day joyfully present them to his Father and theirs, as people who are blameless in his eyes. He looks at a situation where the name of Jesus has been marginalized, it's been minimized, it's been misrepresented, and Jude bursts forth with praise. Because he wants to proclaim that, that Jesus is mighty. He is magnificent. He is majestic. And that's where Jude finishes his letter. Like this grand finale to a fireworks show, Jude lights off all of his rockets of praise. He says, To him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory. May Jesus be radiant in the glory that is his. He says, may, may he be ascribed majesty. May he be he exalted as the king that he is, who is over all things, who is greater than all things. Dominion. May the reign of his dominion be fully realized over everything, everyone, everywhere. Authority. Jude's prayer is that, that Christ's authority, his rule, would outstrip every false god, every phony philosophy that would set itself up against the truth. May his authority rule over all. And he prays it over eternity past. He prays it over the now and the present. And he prays it forward into eternity future. So does Jude have anything to say to us? Yeah, I think he does. All the same things that could lead them astray can lead us astray. And I think the counsel he gave to them applies to us. He says, be in the word. Fall is coming. What are you doing to help yourself really be in the word and growing deeper in it? Maybe you need to get involved in the men's study or the women's study or sign up for a life group and commit yourself on a weekly basis, not just a Sunday morning, but commit yourself to be in a place where you'll look more deeply at God's word and ground yourself in it. He says we need to keep in God's love. We need to pursue purity and service. Is there a part of your life that's out of control? I mean, let's be honest. Some of us have got things that they own us. It may be a sexual addiction. It may be a chemical addiction. It may be a relationship addiction. It may be an anger addiction. But, but you know. You know if there's something that has got the upper hand right now in your life. And maybe this fall is a time for you to step up and say, Father, I want to keep in your love. Maybe you need to come to celebrate recovery and get some other folks who have acknowledged that something has gotten the upper hand. And, and together, they are taking back that territory. Maybe you need to find a place where you're going to serve, where you're going to engage with others, that that is what you need to do to keep in God's love is to give yourself in service. What is that going to be? What does it mean for you to wait patiently for Jesus' timing? Is there an area of your life that you are running ahead of God? 
You've just decided that you're going to have this and you're going to have it for you right now and it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. It's what you want. Could I just give you a loving warning? Running ahead of God like that is a recipe for disaster. And I don't care how good it feels right now and, and how much you want to equate it and say, oh, this must be God's blessing because it's making me happy. I think Jude would say, be careful. When we run ahead of God, we are setting ourselves up for disaster. Care actively for your brothers and sisters. Show mercy to the weak. Intervene with the wandering. And then pray in the Spirit. This summer, we've been looking at a variety of prayers, inspired prayers. Maybe you need to pray the Lord's Prayer, that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Or maybe it's to pray the prayer of the repentant tax collector who simply came knowing he was unworthy and asking for mercy. Maybe it's the prayer of Stephen. Not a prayer asking mercy for himself, but a prayer of mercy over others who had wronged him. The prayer of Paul, that we as God's people would be filled with a deep understanding of God's heart and his desires. That we would be given strength to stay the course even when it's hard. That we would be filled with thanks. Maybe it's to pray like Paul did for Philemon, that our loving and our serving of each other would be genuine and effective. Maybe it's the prayer of Paul for the Ephesian church, where he prayed that they would be granted power. Power that they could comprehend the incomprehensible love of God. That they could know the unknowable depth of his grace. And that they would be filled with the infinite reality of his kindness. And then to pray with Jude, the grand finale. When you find yourself trudging in the mud, you lift up your eyes to the one who is above it all. And you pray the benediction. Say, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory, with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen.